I've got a question about my home. I don't know if this is the best uh, place to ask, but we have a contract with Terminix and they recently put the Trelona compressed termite bait uh, stations all around the house um, to prevent termites from getting into the house. And after listening to so many of you talk about how important it is to protect our planet, I'm wondering what I should do. What would you recommend for a homeowner that has these termite bait stations around their house? Liz, I would say immediately, I, you need to get rid of those. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people with chronic illness and um, those are stories with hindsight, but I would first get rid of it. Um, and there's Google, but there's lots of other options for alternative solutions. The best option, yeah, I fully agree with Joanna, get rid of them. But a very simple option is just to um, get boron, but borax and sugar or borax and honey, mix it together in warm water, put that out as a termite bait, and they will eat that and they'll take that back and kill the queen and kill the colony. Boron is a, is a, is a trace element in most soils, and particularly in Georgia, where you've got a high rainfall, you'll be deficient in Georgia, in boron in your soils. So you will not be causing an environmental problem and it'll be non-toxic for you and your family. I'd just like to add, um, find out what's in the baits. Uh, if, if it's a, an industrial chemical, it could well be dangerous to other things besides termites. Some termite baits these days are natural. Uh, they're based on things like naturally occurring funguses that infect the termite met, uh, nest and, uh, and destroy it. Uh, and there are physical barriers that can be placed to prevent termites getting into your house. So there's a, a lot of options besides using toxic long lasting chemicals. It's, and it's the long lasting, it's the durability of the chemicals uh, that is the real worry because they go on and on and on having an effect on not just termites, but, but everything else, including the inhabitants of the house. Does this work on ants also? The boron and honey? Yeah, cockroaches yes. as well. Great. Um, Sherry, would you like to ask a question? I would, thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to say, I'd like to make two points. Uh, one is a question and the other is just a comment. Um, in terms of the question, I live in central Delaware and there is an uncomfortable amount of poultry farming that goes on around me. Um, and in between the huge chicken house communities, if you will, for lack of a better term, are farm fields that are being grown with GMO uh, crops. They rotate soybeans, wheat, and corn. And these are all feed corn for animals that are going to be killed and slaughtered. Um, I want to believe that even as a small voice in the woods, so to speak, um, <clears throat> with my micro farm, that I can make a difference. However, my observation up to now is that I can be as outspoken and eloquent as I'm given time for, but even if I could convince legislators in this state to make laws, who's going to enforce them? Who will litigate them? I mean, I, at the risk of sounding vulgar, we can make good laws from now till hell freezes over, but who's gonna take the cases to really push the envelope? So that is my question, especially for Jeff Smith, who made the point about some laws being needed, some controls. The comment here, the comment, something I would just like to contribute uh, as an idea for anyone who wants to do their own organic gardening farming is to take advantage of the fact that tree services trim and cut down trees and they make wood chips out of everything. And you can have those delivered to your land free of charge 
you're actually doing them a favor because that way they don't have to pay a fee to drop those chips. I have had as many as eight bright orange Asplund trucks in my front acreage at any one time, dropping chips at the end of the day. And right now I have something like 40 loads of chips and I'm gonna have an orchard out there with no need to add amendments to the soil. All I have to do is be patient and give it two years to compost in. Sherry, your question was, who is going to enforce the laws? Yes. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, I think Ronnie Cummins is going to help them enforce the laws. He's going to sue someone and, and take, some, take some of that uh, recouped money. I think we saw um, over maybe, I think, an estimate of 15 or 16 billion promised, in some cases, spent by Monsanto Bayer for the 125,000 plaintiffs that have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, showing that to all of the class action and group tort uh, lawyers, they're all excited about that. Um, if we create laws regarding no release of genetically engineered microbes, we can give it some teeth. We can say, if you release a microbe, you're responsible for 100% of the environmental health and economic damages associated with your microbe. We might even say that you need to have insurance or post a bond. Now, which insurance company is going to allow, uh, is going to uh, allow their client to release a microbe that can travel all around the world and wreak havoc, uh, knowing that they may have to, to carry the burden of that. Uh, what's interesting about the, the laws is that when you release a microbe anywhere, it could end up everywhere. So interlocking various jurisdictions that can track the microbe, find out its source, is one of the ways that we can give this some teeth. And the economic prospects of being able to be tracked, like, uh, and identified as the source of that microbe, and then having to go and repay, pay back the damage and possibly even remediate. How do you remediate from the environment? It's permanent. So, and it's long term. So, you may have to be strapped with money uh, by the government that'll go on year after year after year, monitoring and possibly co compensating for damage. So, you know, if they if they complain and say we shouldn't have to do this, well, we're saying, well, we should. The the taxpayer should cover you, um, cover your contamination. So there may be ways to build in funding for those that sue, and building in liability in any case. Uh, and I know, uh, thank you, Ronnie, for participating in those lawsuits and looking for the gaps in the um in the policies of these companies that are uh that are exploitable so that they then follow the law yeah we've got a law in the united states passed in 1989 called the biological weapons and terrorism act it passed unanimously in the congress and the the penalties for producing knowingly producing uh, weaponized microbes and biological weapons is life in prison. Okay? <laughs> so how come we have hundreds of labs funded by the Pentagon and big pharma souping up vaccines and pathogens and so on? Well, it's because they claim, oh, this isn't, we're not making weapons. This is dual use research that has, you know, yeah, maybe it has military implication, but it's for medicine, right? So the, obviously, the federal judiciary at this point is not going to enforce that law. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is that we've got several thousand local district attorneys, prosecutors, people like Jim Garrison in New Orleans after the Kennedy assassination, uh, who can be influenced at the grassroots level. We literally have to convince our local prosecutors to call grand juries, you know, and to bring to trial the perpetrators of this type of activity. And if the federal government won't do it, uh, the local prosecutors. We also have uh, 26, well, 3,260 county sheriffs across the U.S. 
uh, many of whom are ready to listen to their constituents, especially in rural America, where I live. And if, if they, they will enforce uh, just laws and not enforce unjust laws. So we got to start thinking that way. We also have police, people in the military, people in fire departments, people in the healthcare industry who are not happy with what's going on. And we need to reach out to unlikely allies as we move forward, uh, if we're gonna take care of this big problem, this big crisis we have. Sherry, I would just also add that you have to have faith that if you step up and take responsibility for what's within your scope of influence, that other people will as well, you're not gonna be alone. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, everyone make a final 30 second summary conclusion, conclusive uh, remark to uh, finalize your, your thoughts. Joanna, you could start. Thank you everybody for sticking with us. And um, you know, I agree with something that was said before that you have to understand the problem and talk about the problem before you can work on the solution. Um, so there we are. Uh, just work on what you can and do what you think is the right stick up for yourself. Speak up for your needs. Um, even if you just did that, you would have profound impacts on this world. Andre? What I want to say is be part of the solution. And that gets back to being the mindful consumer. Think about how you spend your money because that will make the biggest change. If you want to then take activism up to an other levels, you know, we'd love more people to join us and be, you know, activist leaders. And particularly what we'd love to see is the younger generation like Joanna, Jeffrey, getting up there and even younger people now becoming the leaders. Because as Ronnie says, you know, we've got decades that we need to work hard to turn this around and and i really want to support what julian has said this honestly if we don't do this our children and our grandchildren have no future julian yeah i just want to emphasize that chemical poisoning is the largest of the 10 catastrophic threats that now face humanity um, nothing is being done about it on a global scale Thing may be being done at a local or national scale, but globally, it's it's nowhere. It's not even in the in the headspace of governments all over the world or the United Nations and things like that. So we really need to put this on the agenda, folk. This affects every single human being on Earth at the moment. They're being poisoned right as we speak. Their children and grandchildren will be poisoned unless we do something about it. So let's get on and clean up the Earth. I want to thank you, Stephen, for putting this, uh, organizing this event. I really appreciate meeting all these like-minded people who are passionately fighting this cause. Um, I feel like I have to give it every ounce of my being. I, I have, I cry out for the children. I just feel so sad that my generation has left such a wreckage for them to deal with. And I have a lot of hope that those future generations will rise to the occasion and do what they need to do to fix everything we've broken. It makes me very sad that to think what we've done and but it there's hope that we can re reverse it and i think there's tremendous power in regenerative agriculture you know as you say not even to reverse climate change because you can put the carbon back into the soil when you grow healthy foods and help to uh, solve the th those problems as well not just our health not just the soil's health but also the the climate so um, thank you again for doing this. I appreciate it. And, um, and everyone, please do everything you can to make a difference in this heroic undertaking that we're involved in these days. So. Thank you. Ronnie? Yeah, well, we had a saying in the 60s that I always loved, which is that there's only one reason for being a revolutionary, and that's because it's the best way to live. You know, and, and when we think of Let's live every day like it's our last day on earth. And uh, I think we'll inspire the younger generation if we do that. Many of us know people that have been diagnosed with a serious disease. And at the end of the day, when they recover, they claim that that was one of the best, most blessed things in their life because they had a chance to 
reorganize and change. Right now, because of gene editing, we have the we have arrived at the inevitable time in human history where we can easily redirect the streams of evolution for all time with a technology prone to side effects so that future generations will not inherit nature as we did, but the products of accident prone laboratory creations. And so we now have an opportunity for that diagnosis to uplift humanity into a new self recognition. Consciousness, in my opinion, is not local or linear. It is a shared thing as well. And we have an opportunity where the solution to this problem is that humanity then redefines itself as a steward and protector of the gene pool for all future generations. And that new relationship, which I think is called for in so many areas, could ultimately be that great blessing. So that as we face potentially existential threats that Julian's talked about, that I've talked about, that others have talked about, it could be the catalyst of that transformation so that we walk away with a new generation, a new civilization, a new way of defining ourselves and respecting and honoring the intelligence of nature and carrying that forward as appropriate stewards, safeguarding biological evolution as we know it for all future generations. Thank you.